be introducing the speaker today. When we came on camera, so to speak, it turns out that Mark and I have not seen each other for 17 years. But what, back in the bookstore days, it was always a pleasure because Mark would come in with his son, Gavin, and we would have just the most wonderful time. <coughs> he tells the story. I'm, I'm going to say that to the end. Let me give the, the formal, stuffy part of the in, introduction. Dr. West is professor of English at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and he serves as the chair of the Department of English. He received his PhD at Bowling Green University in 1983 and began his association with UNCC in 1984 as an associate professor of English and took on the increasingly challenging roles within the university, including becoming a full professor in 1996, <coughs> excuse me, associate dean for general education in 2002, director of the MA program in liberal studies in 2008, and chair of the English department in 2014. He's been recognized numerous times during his tenure at UNCC, including the Anne Devereaux Jordan Award for Outstanding Achievement in Children's Literature, Children's Literature Association in 2016, the Bonnie E. Cohn Professorship in Civic Engagement Award, UNCC Charlotte in 2019, the Governor James E. Holtzhauser Award for Excellence in Public Service in 2019. He's authored and served as editor or co-editor of numerous books, has been published in dozens of journals and magazines. We could go on and on and on. He's also taught a variety of courses at UNCC, including English classes, honors courses. He's directed numerous master's theses. In addition to all of this, Mark absolutely loves children and believes mightily in the importance of reading to children. Not only does he take the talk, but he's a man who walks the walk. <coughs> we laughed before we started because we reminisced at the days when he and his son would come into the store and then somebody would say, well, we're getting ready to close for the night. You know, it's, it's tough when you have to throw somebody bodily out of the bookstore. When you have two of them, that makes it even tougher. But nevertheless, you could tell this is a man who truly realizes the importance of reading. So let me give him the position now to speak. Join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Mark West. Welcome, Mark. Can you hear me now? I okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction, John. I uh, remember the days that I would see you all the time in what was then called Little Old Professor Bookstore. Now it's called Park Road Bookstore. I still frequently go to that bookstore all the time. It was stressful to me when the store had to close because of the pandemic because um, we weren't able to actually go in. But now we can again, and I'm happy that we are able to visit the store on a regular basis. I thank you for your invitation and it was inspiring to me listening to you all talk about the activities of your club, how much the members of your club are engaged in community um, service activities. Because I believe that community service, while it's a wide ranging sort of uh, enterprise, is nonetheless incredibly important and uh, sometimes we get so caught up in our own little world that we forget that there's a bigger world out there, a bigger world that needs our help, especially now. So I commend you all for all of the different um, community engagement projects that you uh, so uh, willingly do. And uh, on behalf of the community that benefits from those activities, uh, I thank you. I also thank you for the invitation to talk about the importance of reading aloud. When uh, Kevin first approached me about speaking to your group, one of the things he said in his email was that um, he was concerned about 
children falling behind in terms of reading and literacy skills as a result of this pandemic that we're in, where children are in situations where they cannot attend school physically and are having to uh, take classes, in, not in their classroom, but on the kitchen table with a laptop computer and parents trying to uh, play the role of a teacher to some degree. And um, it's a justifiable concern. Um, we know that as hard as we work in trying to make online instruction work, it just doesn't work as well as kids being actually in the classroom with teachers who have been trained and have experience in teaching kids how to read and such. And um, when we as parents or grandparents are trying to help our children or grandchildren uh, through this difficult time, um, we're sometimes a little bit out of our depth. We're not really sure exactly what it is we're supposed to do to help. Sometimes it feels like when you're helping your kid uh, sitting there at the kitchen table, it feels not so much like helping but nagging, you know, like, uh, have you done your homework today? Don't you're supposed to log in and uh, do this or that? And it, it doesn't really feel like you're educating a kid. It feels like you're kind of just bothering them. Um, but there are ways that parents, grandparents, and caretakers of all sorts can help children. And one of those ways is reading aloud to children. I am a tremendous proponent of reading aloud to children. I think it has tremendous value. And I want to share with you, I think, why I think this is so important. Now, um, some people are surprised to learn, since I'm this, you, you, you heard all these uh, uh, sort of semi-fictional things about my credentials. <laughs> but um, but uh, some people are surprised to learn that I have a learning disability. And my learning disability is fairly common and it's called dyslexia. Dyslexia is a problem that, uh, quite a common disability, but it creates problems with reading. Reading and spelling and writing, all of those things were difficult for me when I was a child. Um, I had, I was always in the lowest of every group when I was, I went to this teeny little school in the mountains of Colorado. Um, and, uh, you know, they divided it by ability, and uh, they used to name it by birds. So there were the blue jays, and there were the robins, and then there were the vultures. And I was always in the vulture group because, uh, because we weren't, we didn't do so well. Um, and my problem wasn't that I didn't have uh, intelligence. My problem was that letters just sort of swam, and I couldn't really understand exactly how to put words together um, the, I had tremendous problems with B's and D's. They still didn't make any sense to me as much as people would try to explain it. Um, I had trouble with left and right. I had trouble with orders. You know, I still do. I'm 65 years old now, and um, I'm largely compensated for things, but I hate passwords because I still transpose things. And in the process of transposing, I sometimes make a mistake entering a password, and I don't even see it. Um, and then the computer gets upset with me and says, this is your second try, buddy. If you don't get it right the next time, we're gonna kick you off the computer. It's like, no, don't kick me off the computer, I'm trying. Um, so um, <laughs> the way I managed to overcome my dyslexia in some ways was because of my father. My father, um, eccentric person, um, he grew up uh, in New York City, but developed a love of the mountains. When he was a young man, he took a trip to um, the Alps and decided he wanted to move someplace that reminded him of the Alps. And so in the early 1950s, he bought with my mother uh, the side of a mountain in Colorado. And that's where he raised my, myself and my brother, my sister. Um, I literally grew up on the side of a mountain. Uh, my brother still owns that mountain right now. He inherited it. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And I look at it now and think, I grew up there? This looks like some place Robert Redford would grow up in or something, but, but uh, that's where I grew up. Um, but I grew up without television. I grew up in a very rural, isolated environment. Um, and uh, that was largely because of things that were important to my father. 
when I began to have trouble in school, my father compensated for that by reading aloud to me and to my brother and my sister. It meant more to me than my brother and sister. We have talked about this in our adulthood, um, but to me, it was amazingly important. And he read aloud almost every night from when I was just a little kid, preschool age, right up through eighth grade. Uh, the last book he read to us was not a kid's book at all. It was a book called Deliverance. You may have heard of it. Um, that wasn't a kid's book um, by any stretch of the imagination. But um, he would read in this wonderful voice of his, uh, book after book after book, and every single night we would gather together, my brother, my sister, and I in the living room, and he would always, uh, he loved Dickens, for example. Dickens was his favorite author. And we always had to say the name of the book and the name of the author before he would start. So he would pick up David Copperfield and then he would say, oh, who wrote David Copperfield? And we would say, Dickens, like it's been for the past three weeks. But um, we had to say it anyway and then he'd get started and off we'd go and I'd get transported into the world that Dickens created or any of the other authors that uh, my father read to us. It was so important to me because it gave me a love of literature that I was able to carry through to in, into my adult life, even though I couldn't read those books very well myself. Um, but because my father read them, I fell in love with the stories. And as I gradually, as my brain kind of recalibrated and I was able to read on my own, um, it was, um, I had that incentive that, my, that reading aloud gave to me to want to go through the trouble to learn how to overcome my disability. That is one of the most important things about reading aloud. It gives kids an incentive to read. Remember, learning how to read is difficult, even for kids that don't have any kind of disability. It's still a difficult process. But reading aloud becomes a kind of the phrase, eyes, eye on the prize. Well, the, the prize is the story, the literature, the language. Um, when you're learning how to read and you're sounding out words, it, it's not really fun. But if you understand that once you unlock that, uh, then you have all of these treasures waiting for you. And I owe that to my father. Reading aloud is also something that all parents can do. Even if you don't read it aloud with great fluency, it's still, kids are a very forgiving audience. And they will, um, they will uh, appreciate the time that you take and reading aloud to your kids. Remember sometimes when you're trying to teach kids how to read, well, let's say you're, I mean, I, I don't have anything against phonics, but it takes a long time to learn how to teach phonics. It's not something you can just do. Um, so, uh, but reading aloud is something you can just do. You can just do it with kids. Um, one of the other wonderful things about reading aloud is that it introduces to children words and gives them an ability to understand language that they might not pick up just in terms of the daily conversation that takes place within the household. Sometimes um, through hearing a book, you pick up words as a child that you might not otherwise hear in your day-to-day -day speech. Um, and that's one of the ways in which kids uh, acquire their vocabulary, build their vocabulary. One of the books that I read aloud to my son all the time when he was little, I read up so often that, you know how kids can kind of memorize a book and when you try to shorten it, they know when you're cutting out a sentence or two and they correct you even though they can't actually read, they have this excellent memory. Um, and so I read to my son the tale of Peter Rabbit on a very regular basis. And um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. Do you remember Novello, those of you who've been in Charlotte for a while, remember that big literary festival that the that Charlotte Library had for years? Um, and it always had a kid's part. And um, it was like during the kid's part, um, oftentimes librarians would dress up like characters. And, um, and I would always take our son Gavin to Novello and the, uh, the librarians knew me, of course, because I did so many things with the library. Um, and one time, one of the librarians was dressed up like Peter Rabbit. And, um, 
and uh, the, she hopped up to Gavin because she knew she knew who I was, and uh, Gavin recognized Peter Rabbit right off the bat. And um, what happened next comes right out of the book. So uh, in the book, um, Peter's broken into Mr. McGregor's garden. He's raiding it like rabbits do. And uh, Mr. McGregor is chasing after him. And, um, and I'll read you a little passage. It says, Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, stop thief. Remember that phrase, stop thief? Well, um, when Gavin saw the librarian dressed up as Peter Rabbit, he looked at Peter Rabbit and said, stop thief. So it becomes one of these little moments that um, we can share because we share a story. That scene continues on and, and uh, Peter is uh, being chased through the garden and, um, and things don't go too well for him. He gets stuck in a net. You see that net there? And uh, he thinks he's going to die. I wanted to read you the next page. Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Okay, this book is now in public domain. And so as a result, people are always publishing simplified versions of it. And they always take out that sentence that I just read to you. That part that says, and flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Because I think, oh, kids don't know those words. Implored, exert, those are two hard of words. So they say, and they told them to try harder. Well, you know, they shouldn't do that because that's how kids learn new words. Um, and by reading aloud to kids um, and being true to the text, um, kids absorb those words. You could actually reinforce that by asking kids, kids questions and say, what do you think the birds are saying? And things like that where the kids can, through the context of the story, acquire this new vocabulary. If we only shared with kids the words that they already know, they would never expand their vocabulary. They just go ma ma da da all the time because they need to know new, they need to hear new words in order to acquire that and build it into their vocabulary. Reading aloud can do that. It can also provide kids with an understanding of how language works. Now, um, one of the other wonderful things about reading aloud to children is that it provides a shared experience so that when you are talking to your grandchild or you're talking to your child or you're talking to a kid that you just happen to take care of on occasion um, and you've read a story together, then you can make reference to that character or to a scene that took place. Um, when, our, when our son was little, we read aloud all the Harry Potter books to him. Uh, we started off, with, of course, with the first one when he was littler. As he got older, he was certainly uh, able to read the books himself, but we made it a tradition in our family that we would read all the Harry Potter books as a family together aloud, and that's what we did. You might remember that in one of the books, one of the characters has this phrase that he says all the time, and it's constant vigilance. We, that became part of our family vocabulary. And so when we would be talking about things, um, and we, it was some reason you'd have to take, uh, pay particular attention to something, we would just automatically say, constant vigilance and we knew automatically whom we were talking about because it came out of that shared experience of reading Harry Potter aloud. That's one of the other wonderful things about reading aloud is that you have the shared experience that you and your ch ch children or your grandchildren um, can make reference to and understand what you're saying. Then the last thing I want to say to you about the value of reading aloud is that kids today in this pandemic 
as you were talking about today um, uh, with the stresses that we are living through, kids are experiencing a lot of stress themselves. There's a lot of anxiety. They miss not being able to play with their friends. They don't understand why they can't do this or that that they used to do. They want to go play uh, uh, baseball, but they can't. And it doesn't make any sense to them. And so they have anxiety and they, they're, they're not exactly sure what's happening. Uh, people seem anxious. Their parents may have lost their jobs. Um, but sometimes it's scary to talk about your feelings. One of the things that books and reading aloud enable us to do is to create a little bit of distance so that we can talk about how this character feels about something rather than how I feel about something. Um, let me see if I can explain to you what I mean. Sometimes if you're talking to a teenager or a kid that might be having problems, they might say, you know, mom, um, I have this friend who's concerned about this or that or the other thing. You know what? They're not really talking about their friend. They're talking about themselves, but it's a little bit easier to say, I have this friend that's having this problem. And you as the parent can play along and say, well, maybe your friend should do this, or maybe your friend should do that. Or what do you think your friend is thinking about in terms of this or that, whatever the concern might be. But it gives you that ability to have a little bit of distance so you don't have to say, uh, um, mommy, I'm worried that you seem really depressed and you seem to have lost your job and I'm not really sure what's happening. Um, but if you can talk about it in the context of a character that's going through an experience that's similar, then, then it's a little easier to broach or, 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 or delve into these sensitive anxiety provoking situations that we need to talk about. And eventually as things become more open and safe, we can maybe acknowledge that what we're really talking about is ourselves. But we sometimes need that, a phrase that sometimes education people use is scaffolding. You know, I think of scaffolding in terms of building stuff, you know, that when you're trying to fix up the, 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 the steeple on the church, you might build a scaffold around it to be able to go up there and put the tiles back up. But that idea of scaffolding also is a way to kind of, um, encircle an idea that we can then talk about from the safety of the scaffolding rather than uh, hanging on to the steeple itself and hoping that we don't fall off. Now we are very lucky, those of us who live in Charlotte, that we have um, working in Charlotte a wonderful group called Read Charlotte that um, does a lot of literacy work in the community. And one of the things that they always advocate uh, in terms of reading aloud to children is what they call active reading. It, it sounds very fancy, but it's really pretty simple in terms of its concept. Active reading isn't just simply a matter of reading aloud to a child, as good as that is, uh, but active reading is, I wonder what Peter's thinking right now, you could ask the child before you turn the page, or what would you do if you were in this situation? In other words, you're eliciting a response from the child, giving them uh, open-ended questions in which they can then talk about their feelings. And as a result, um, they become more engaged in the story. I encourage those of you who have kids and who are in a situation to uh, read aloud to do some of that active reading techniques. The last thing I wanted to say uh, to you about reading aloud is something really simple and mechanical. Um, if you're reading aloud to a class, let's say I used to volunteer to read to my son's class once a week for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. So in kindergarten through fifth grade, I read aloud to his class. Um, but one of the things, if you're reading aloud to a group of kids, you have to develop a weird skill. You have to learn how to hold a book like this so that your thumb kind of keeps the pages open. And then you have to be able to learn how to read from the side of your eyes with your peripheral vision so that the kids can see the pictures. And as you're reading aloud, you need to then fan it out so that all the kids in the group can see it. If you're reading aloud to kids and you're looking at the pictures, but they don't see it, 
well, then they don't get as engaged in the process. So the next time you're reading aloud, whether it's to a Sunday school group or to a, a group at school or some such thing, uh, try to remember to do that. But most important is share stories with children. Give them an opportunity to hear you get excited about a story for you to say, oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. Because if you get excited about a story, it's, you know, they're talking about how everything is, uh, how things uh, spread through the air. Well, a lot of bad things spread through the air, like viruses and such. But good things can spread through the air, too. A love of stories can spread through the air through your excitement. It is, in a good sense, contagious. So thank you for inviting me to your group. And I'm happy to answer any questions or make up responses. I'm pretty good at making things up. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. West. This has really been a fascinating discussion today and really highlights which, uh, the importance of reading aloud. Oh, I'm in the middle of a book called The Professor and the Mad Men by Simon Winchester about mm -hmm. James Murray, uh, who is the editor of the Oxford English uh, mm -hmm. Dictionary. And one of the th early passages talks about his father reading aloud to him. And this man went on to be one of the great uh, etym etymologists of all time. Is that mm -hmm. right. appropriate? Excellent. Uh, do we have any questions from the group? Uh, Jenny, please unmute yourself. And then Kevin, right after that. Oh, uh, Jenny, just... Uh, oh, Jenny, if you... Uh, you have a question? Uh, I was just going to say, we have a eight month old grandson that we've been babysitting. And is this a good time to start reading to him? Yes. You should start reading to kids long before they begin to acquire the ability to speak. Because kids are absorbing words, absorbing language. Um, uh, their brains are learning at a rate faster than, than, than we will ever do at any other point in our lives. Um, and so, one of the ways in which kids acquire a language is by just sort of processing all those sounds um, and beginning to piece it together. Uh, it's done almost by magic, it seems. But the more, the richer the, the verbal environment that a kid is raised in, the more they're going to learn. Um, and there have been all sorts of studies. I have a colleague who's a linguist and study brain development with children. And it, it really does show that kids, even babies who are being read aloud to, uh, develop a facility with languages far better than babies that are not read aloud to. Um, so you might seem kind of silly to be reading aloud to a baby who just doesn't understand a word that you're saying, but they actually are beginning to understand it. Kids understand words long before they say them. Um, so uh, they begin to understand it and, and almost sort of absorb how language works, how sentences work. Um, uh, so those, I, we started reading aloud to our son when he was he just a little, little baby and kept right up with it right through. Thank you. Uh, Dr. West, this is Kevin Kendrick. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to, um, you, you know a little bit about our club and how we like to get involved in community projects and things like that. Some of us are actually tutoring second and third graders at different Title I schools, uh, although we're having to do it remotely now. Uh, we also have uh, one of our members who is a book buddy for someone at Sedgefield Middle School as well. Are there any other opportunities that you are aware of that we as a service, as a, as a service club can engage in with the community? that would benefit groups of children, particularly children at risk? Well, what I would suggest is contacting um, uh, Read Charlotte because they, they, they work with every literacy group in Charlotte. They're kind of an umbrella organization. Um, and uh, they have their own contacts. There are other groups in Charlotte that do literacy work, especially with children that are more at risk. Um, uh, the public library, most of the work that I have done in the community has been through the public library. We have a wonderful public library system, but uh, right now the public library um, is much more limited as to what it can do uh, because they've just reopened the public libraries, but in a rather limited way. So they don't have um, the story times, they don't have the um, kind of community 
projects. You know, right around this time of the year, uh, normally the public library would be putting on Epic Fest. I'm on the steering committee for Epic Fest, which is this wonderful community literacy project, but Epic Fest is canceled this year. So um, there's a lot fewer things to do. Um, but if you can do things even informally with kids in the neighborhood or friends or whatever who can come over, um, the more you can do, the better. Uh, I hope that we can eventually get this pandemic behind us and be able to resume some of the community projects that we were, all of us probably enjoy doing that it's hard to do today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I would give a shout out to Promising Pages and Eric Law and his team over there. They are providing a number of books. Uh, it's in the millions now, is it not? Uh, Eric, yeah, would Promising you Pages in? does wonderful work and it provides actually kids with actual physical books. Um, you know, kids really, uh, we're, we live in this virtual world so much, but it's important for kids to actually have physical books, to interact with a physical book, to be able to hold it in their hands and turn the pages and understand how a book works. It's a form of technology, really, but it's something that, that we just take for granted. But it's a skill that kids have to acquire and uh, understand how to work with a book. So I, I commend Promising Pages and other groups and other, I'm, I've recently been uh, approached by a group in uh, the Durham area called uh, Book Harvest, I think it's called. Um, but there's other groups that the purpose is to provide kids with books so they have their own libraries. And I think that's very important. I'd like to give a shout out to, to uh, and she won't say anything, but Angie Riker here. Uh, does Angie, and as Jenny and I have been kind of discussing, we have so many great active readers in this club that we're, we're very fortunate to have Angie and Kelly Cates and Eric. They all do a wonderful job of, of engaging with these kids and, and engaging in active reading. And thank yeah. you for saying having books is such a big thing. Scholastic Book Services was a huge thing in my life when I was a kid, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that they're still around. Yeah, books are, I, um, some people thought that the physical book would disappear but I'm, I'm glad that it hasn't, and I'm glad that we still have books and that we can, you know, that they're, they're, they're just wonderful things. Um, and uh, kids, kids should have their own books, um, their own little libraries, and um, even if it's just a few books. One of the things that kids do with books is they'll go back and look at the same book over and over and over and over again. That might not make a lot of sense to us as adults, but it's one of the ways in which kids just naturally reinforce the skills that they, the knowledge that they are acquiring through interacting, reading with a book. Um, one of the things that little kids like to do is read books aloud to their dolls or to the stuffed animals. They like to play the role of the teacher, you know, and they'll say, they'll gather, I've seen kids do that, where they gather together their stuffed animals and then they pretend they're the teacher and then they're gonna read the book to the, to the stuffed animals, but that's a good skill too. Um, I encourage that, so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in providing kids with their own books. I'm, I'm not going to spill any beans, but I know somebody who used to put her sister, who was a baby, in, in, a, in the high chair and try to teach her, and that baby would try to crawl away. When <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any other questions? I, I just wanted to say, um, you um, said read Charlotte. Monroe actually happens to be a neighbor of ours. <laughs> He's the one that runs Reed Charlie. Yes, yes. So yeah, <laughs> say, say hello to him for me. I'm a big fan of his. Awesome, we will. <laughs> Excellent. Angie, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, when you were talking about some volunteer opportunities, I'll share with you guys in the, in the spring, I hope that the libraries will open up and we can do story times again. Mm -hmm. But every spring, we partner with Charlotte Mecklenburg Libraries and do special um, story times. And we have a speech pathologist that goes in and actually does a lot of education with parents on how to read with kids. Um, and we do these special story times, but we always need volunteers to go with us to help kind of uh, pass out surveys. And we do like, you know, bubbles and stuff like that at the end of the story. So, um, 
in the spring, hopefully life will be normal again and we'll do those. But I will, um, if you guys are interested, more than happy to um, give you guys volunteer opportunities to go do story times with us at the library. It's a, it is a lot of fun. We do infant and baby story times and it, it's a lot of fun. And Jenny, I was going to say for your grand, for your grandchild, tummy time is a great time. When the babies are on their belly, it's a great time to just stick a book right under their face. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's an idea and you can get waterproof books too to put in the bathtub with them which is really fun too. wow that's interesting excellent any other questions or comments excellent uh remember october 2nd thank you again uh, dr west that was a wonderful uh, wonderful lecture thank you so much for joining us thank you so much with, for what you do in the community for literacy we really admire you, you and i my pleasure. So, you again. Uh, again, October 2nd. Absolutely, sir. Uh, again, October 2nd, we will be having our uh, next in person social. Uh, it'll likely be again in Dilworth Neighborhood Park unless one of the pavilions becomes available. And Dr. West, you're welcome. We'll send you an invite. You're welcome to join us for a meal and to meet some of us in person if, if, you're, if your schedule allows. Okay. And uh, if there's no further business, we're going to go ahead with the uh, four-way pledge at this point in time. So if you want to unmute yourself and we can have a little cacophony of the of all the things we think, say or do. First. Is it the truth? Second. Is it fair to all it fair to concern? concern? Third. We will build goodwill and better friendships. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And finally, will it be fun? Be fun. fun. Absolutely. Thank you all for being here. Great to see all your happy faces. We'll keep the chat, uh, the call alive for about another 10, 15 minutes so people can catch up. But other than that, your, uh, the, me the formal part of the meeting is over, but great to see you all here. Great to have you here. Kevin? Yes, go ahead, Kevin. I just wanted to, uh, uh, if you could uh, let Dr. West know too that uh, there will be a donation made on his behalf. Absolutely, uh, Dr. West, we'll be making a donation on your behalf. Let's make it to a literary cause, uh, maybe yes. Promising Pages. There we go. Promising yeah. Pages will be the beneficiary thank you. of the thank donation you. on your behalf. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. And feel free to email me if you have any questions or concerns. I'd be happy to, to uh, interact with you individually. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. West. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks again Bye. for the invitation. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>